Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 095 Basic Algebra. In this video, we're going to look at set section 7.6, which is greatest common factor. And we often refer to it as just GCF, greatest common factor. Now, <clears throat> one thing we have to recall is prime numbers. When we deal with prime numbers, um, it's a tool that we're going to use to actually find the greatest common factor when we're dealing with integers. Um, hopefully, we recall how to do prime factorization. Maybe we recall using factor trees. So to find the greatest common factor, we're essentially looking for the product of the primes that each value has in common. And that's why it's called the greatest common factor. Now, if we look at the first example here, we have 36 and 32. I'm going to do a factorization. I'm going to do a, uh, maybe we do a factor tree. I know 36 is 6 times 6. And I know that 6 is 2 times 3. And this 6 would be 2 times 3. So I can see I have two factors of 2 and two factors of 3. So maybe I write it as 2 squared times 3 squared. That's the same thing as 36. Now, 32, I can break that down. Maybe I recognize that it's 8 and 4, which this is 4 and 2. And this would be 2 and 2. And I can factor 4 down a little bit further in my factor tree. And I see, well, 32 has five factors of 2, 2 to the fifth. Now, to find the greatest common factor, I can just say, well, what do they have in common? They each have factors of 2. Well, how many do they have the most of? Well, this one has 2. This one has 5. They each have at least 2. So its greatest common factor would be 2 factors of 2, because they each have that. That's the greatest common factor. Well, 2 factors of 2 is 2 times 2, which is 4. So the greatest common factor of 36 and 32 would be 4. Both of these numbers are divisible by 4. No value larger than this will divide both of those numbers. So it is the greatest common factor. If we look at this value, one thing I want to draw your attention to is this is a negative. And we have to realize that every number is a, a product of 1. 1 times that number is that number. So whenever I see a negative, I can also think of it as a factor of negative 1. So just keep that in mind. If I do the same thing with these values, 8 is 4 times 2, and 4 is 2 times 2. So 8 is the same thing as 2 cubed. 22 is 2 times 11. These are primes, so that's as far as I can go. So 22 is 2 times 11. And then 2 is already a prime value. So then I look at these values, and well, one thing I have to go back to is this is a negative. I can think of it as negative 1 times that 2 cubed. Because if 2 cubed is 8 times a negative 1, we'll make it negative 8. So we can factor out a negative 1 as the, one of the common factors. So negative 1 times 2 cubed, and then we have 22 is 2 times 11, and 2 is, is what it is. Now, what do they all have in common? Well, they each have at least one 2. So that's one of its common factors. And if we look, well, this, only has, this has a negative 1. None of the others have a negative. So that's not common. This has more 2's. These don't have any more than that 1, 2. This happens to be the greatest common factor. Now, with some numbers, such as 49 and 15, our next example, if we factor these out, well, I know 49 is 7 times 7, which is just 7 squared. And 15 is 3 times 5. If we look at these values, they have no primes in common. Well, the only prime they have in common is 1. 1 is the greatest common factor. And most of the time, it has no purpose to factor out a 1, because every value has a factor of 1. It might be beneficial to sometimes factor out a negative 1. And we'll see that in some examples coming up. So I have this next example here, 13, 39, and 26. I want you to try this one on your own to find the greatest common factor of these three numbers. All right, now we're going to look at the greatest common factor of polynomials. Because we're going to have these variables, we have to assess them the same way. 
Honestly, I feel that the variables are easier to factor than the numbers. Because we have to treat these as prime numbers because we don't know what they are. We, don't, we can't really break them down. y cubed is just y times y times y, three factors of y. y to the sixth is six factors of y, and y to the seventh is seven factors of y. They have in common factors of y. What is the uh, greatest value that each of them has? Well, this one has three. This has 6, that has 7. Well, 3 is common to all of them. This one has at least 3. This one has 3 or more. This one has 3 or more. So my greatest common factor is y cubed. All three of these would be divisible by y cubed. y cubed is the greatest common factor of these variables. Now, sometimes we'll have a combination of variables and numbers. And we just combine the two concepts of dealing with the number like we did in the previous examples and dealing with the variables. If I look at these two here, if I want to find the greatest common factor, the first thing I do is assess the numbers. What do they have in common? Well, if I break 15 down, it's the same as 5 times 3. And this is 3. So 3 would be a common factor. If I look at the variable, this has an x. This doesn't have any x's, so that's not common at all. The only thing I was able to find in here was 3. 3 is the greatest common factor of these two uh, expressions. If we look at this one here, we have three expressions. And we can see they have coefficients and they have variables. So the first thing I'm going to do is take, you know, break it down, do a one step at a time. Well, let's look at the numbers. We have 2, 4, and 2. Well, 4 is 2 times 2, or 2 factors of 2. So I know they at least have one factor of 2. This has a factor of 2. This has two factors of 2. And that has one factor of 2. They all have at least one factor of 2. That's what they have in common. Then I just move on to the next variable. I see x's and y's here. Well, let's deal with the x's first. This has 10 x's. This only has 1. And this has 3. So 10, 1, and 3, they each have at least one x. That's common to all three terms. And then we look at the y's, y squared, y squared, y cubed. So we have 2, 2, and 3. They all have at least two y's. So when we find that greatest common factor, 2xy squared, that would be the answer to these three expressions. So the greatest common factor is 2xy squared. This one here, we have 7ab squared, 21a squared b, and 14ab. I want you to try this one on your own and find the greatest common factor of these three terms. All right, now sometimes we deal with uh, polynomials that are the sums or differences of terms. We know that this is a linear uh, expression. This one, obviously, uh, more complex. It's a 12th power ex or 12th degree expression. And so we're going to deal with these in algebra. So <clears throat> we have to find the greatest common factor of their terms. Now, of these terms, I can look and say, well, 3x and 15, I dealt with one very similar to that just a while ago. But when we're factoring something out, we have to realize what we're actually doing is undoing a distributive property. We're very familiar with distributive property at this point, so we're going to undo it. What do these have in common? Well, we, I, 3 goes into both of these. That's a common factor. Now, if I'm going to pull a 3 out of this, this is called the process of factoring. Essentially, it's division. Because distributive property was multiplication, I'm undoing distributive property, so it is a process of division. If I divide a 3 out of the first term, it would just leave me with x. If I divide a 3 out of the second term, it would leave me with 5. But we still have this sum. One way to check our work when we're factoring a polynomial is to do distribution. Distribute this back through. Do I get the same thing I started with? Once I determine the common factor, I can divide it out and then write it as a product. Three times this quantity is the same as that. Let's look at this one here. We've seen a similar example. We have 2, 4, and 2. Well, I know they each have at least a 2. 
Then I can move to the x's and say, well, this has 10. That only has 1. That has 3. So they all have an x, but only one of them is common to all three terms. Then we have the y squared, the y squared, and the y cubed. Well, they all have y's, but they all have at least two of them. So 2xy squared is the common factor. If I'm going to pull it out of these terms, I have to write it as a product. I'm undoing distribution. So if I divide a 2 out of this, 2 over 2 would be 1. So we don't need to write 1. x to the 10th, if I'm dividing out an x, I just decrease that exponent by 1. If we recall our quotient rule when we talked about uh, the rules of exponents, 10x divided by x, or 10x over x, 10 minus 1 is 9. y squared, we're going to divide out a y squared. Well, y squared over y squared is just 1. 1 times x to the 9th is just x to the 9th. So we've pulled out both of these y squared. There it is. So we move on to the next term. If I divide a 2 out of this, I get 2. If I divide an x out, I get 1. 2 times 1 is just 2. If I divide the y squared out, I just get 1. 1 times 2 is still 2. So we see we factored it down to just that number. Here, I do the same thing. I can pull out a 2, divide out a 2, and that would give me 1. I can divide out an x, and that would leave me with 2x's. And I can divide out 2y's, or y squared, which would leave me with 1y. 3 minus 2 is 1y. Now, to check my work, I could distribute 2xy squared times x to the 9th does give me 2x to the 10th y squared. 2xy squared times 2 would give me 4xy squared. And 2xy squared times x squared y, well, that would give me 3x's and 3y's times 2. 2 times 3x's and 3y's, x cubed, y cubed. All right, let's look at this one here. 13 I recognize as a prime. 7 I recognize as a prime. And this has an x and that has a y. There is nothing I can do with this. I can't factor out any integer because these are prime. And these are different variables, so I have to treat them as prime. We have primes and nothing is in common, so I cannot factor anything out. I have to move on. And when we have something like this, we might call it prime because nothing factors out. I could factor out a 1, but that's not really going to change anything. It's this value. All right, let's look at uh, the next set of examples. Sometimes when we're factoring something out, we can factor out an entire group of terms. If we look at this, I have x times the quantity 3 plus y. And I have 3 times the quantity 3 plus y. What I notice is x and 3 are both being multiplied by 3 plus y. So I can say that's the common factor, 3 plus y. So I can factor out this sum, and I leave it in parentheses. Now, because I have two other terms that are being summed together, both of these have to be multiplied by x and that positive 3. So I put these values in parentheses as well. So I see this whole group that I can factor out. I have to put these two together, and I do so using parentheses. Now, this one is a little trickier because we have to be careful. Because of every value, regardless of what it is, does have a factor of 1. And generally, we ignore that value. But when we're factoring it out, we have to always keep in mind anything divided by itself is 1. So if I look at this example, I say, well, they, these, I see two of these c minus 5s. What is this c minus 5 actually being multiplied by? We see a negative in front of these parentheses. Well, we can think of it as a negative 1. Negative 1, I could distribute that negative, and that would change the sign. Negative 1 times c would be negative c. Negative 1 times negative 5 would be a positive 5. So I could distribute that as if it were a negative 1. So just for the sakes of uh, convenience, I'm going to put in that negative 1. And now I can see, well, c minus 5, c minus 5 is common to this, these two uh, terms here, this term minus this term. Now, if I factor that out, divide it out, c minus 5 divided by c minus 5 is 1 times ab. So I would have ab. 
negative c minus 5 divided by c minus 5. c minus 5 over c minus 5 is 1. 1 times negative 1, or 1 times a negative, is negative 1. So <clears throat> the reason why I put that 1 in there, and eventually, if you do this enough, you won't need it. But you'll see that if I'm going to factor something out, it doesn't just go away. It has to have some factor left behind. Well, 1 is a factor of every number. So if you factor this out, it's essentially dividing. c minus 5 over c minus 5 is 1 minus 1. And that's what we got right here. So be careful with that one. This one here, I want you to try it for yourself. Notice that these are in common. Don't make a mistake here. There, we have to always have a value there. So try this yourself and uh, see how you do. Good luck. We're going to try this. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is factor by grouping. If we're going to factor by grouping, we need a four-term polynomial, or sometimes more, but generally we'll just see four-term polynomials. So factor by grouping, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a line here to separate them into these two terms and these two terms. Now, if I look at the first two terms, I notice they each have a y in common. So I'm going to factor out a y from the first two terms. Well, if I factor out a y, it just leaves me with an x for the first term. If I factor out a y here, it doesn't just go away. It becomes that factor of 1. y divided by y is 1. I can check it using distribution. X or y times x is xy. y times 1 is y. Make sure you're checking your work. If I look at these two terms now, I can say, OK, they both have a 2, so that's a common factor. So I'm going to factor out a positive 2. And I make sure I write this sign in here because there is still two, uh, two sets that we're dealing with. So I have to realize that this was a sum or difference of terms. So when I factor that value out, I keep a sign with it. So when I factor out this 2, I get x. When I factor out a 2 here, I get 1. 2 over 2 is 1. And now I can actually take it further. And if we notice, it looks like the previous examples. We have this entire quantity that is common to both of these terms, this term and that term. So I'm going to factor out x plus 1. And the terms that are both multiplied by x plus 1 are y and positive 2. And that's why it's important to bring that sign with. So we see we factored it down to this times that. And if we recall in the previous section when we dealt with FOIL and multiplying, I could use FOIL here to check my work. If I FOIL this back out, I better get this value that I started with. All right, we're going to look at this next example. And I'm going to divide this half and that half, separate it into two separate terms. The first two terms, I see, well, they each have a factor of 3. 6 is divisible by 3, so 3 is common. But I also have a's. Well, this one has two a's, and this one only has one a. So I can take out one of the a's. And when I do that, 3a, if I factor out a 3a, 3 over 3 is 1. a squared over a is just 1a. 2 minus 1 is 1, 1a. If I factor a 3 out of here, I get 2, and it's a positive 2. And if I factor out an a, a over a is 1. 1 times 2 is just 2. So I get a plus 2. All right. If I look at these two, well, a and 2 don't have any common factors. But I draw my attention to these negatives. They each have a negative. And my goal is to essentially see something like this, a plus 2. Well, these are both positive. How can I change these signs? Because I want to have a common factor without changing any values. Well, if they're both negative and 1 is a factor of every number, I can factor out that common value of negative 1. If I do that, factoring out a negative is just going to change their signs. This would become a positive a. This would become a positive 2. So sometimes it's necessary to factor out a 1. And now if we look at it, we have a plus 2. And a plus 2 is common to both of these terms. So I can factor out a plus 2. And if I do that, it leaves me with 3a and that negative 1. And if I wanted to check my work, I could FOIL this out. And before I combine my like terms, I will have this value I started with. 
All right, <clears throat> let's look at some more examples here. We have 5x plus 15 plus xy minus 3y. Well, we notice we have two variables in, uh, amongst these four expressions, or four terms. So we're just going to take it two at a time. I split it into these two and those two. And I look at this one. I say, hey, they're both divisible by 5. They each have a factor of 5. This one has an x and this one doesn't, so that's not common. So I have 5x plus, if I divide a 5 out of there, I get 3x plus 3. If I look at the next two terms, I have an xy and a negative 3y. Well, 1 and 3, no common factors other than 1. And we have uh, x. There's no x over there, so that's not common. We have a y and a y. y is the only common value here. So I bring it out a positive y. And when I factor that out, it leaves me with just the x, because I divide out the y, minus the 3, because I divide out the y. And if we look at this example here, are these common? No, they are not. That's as far as I can go. I can't go any further, because this is x plus 3, which is a different value than x minus 3. So I'm going to stop right there. All right, this one here, I want you to try it for yourself. Uh, find the common factor of the first two terms. Find the common factor of the next two terms. And then put it together. Check your work. So this has been section 7.6, determining the greatest common factor. Thank you for watching.